Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another program of Study the Word. This program is sponsored every week by the Kirkwood Church of Christ that meets at 948 South Guyer Road in Kirkwood, Missouri. We're glad you've joined us. This program deals with Bible questions, and we go ahead and provide a Bible answer. We've got a question that came from one of our viewers, so we hope you'll stay tuned for the next half hour. If you have a question, you see that phone number? You can call it in, leave it on voicemail, or text your question. We'll use it on this program. The uh, website is there for you to find our location if you're not familiar with our area because we extend you a warm invitation to come and visit with us. Come in and uh, observe what takes place. You'd be welcomed with a, with a warm handshake and a smile. And we're glad you would come and be with us. So please take advantage of that opportunity to assemble with us. Also, we upload our past TV programs on our website, so you might want to check that out, all the Bible questions and the Bible answers that are provided. I'm going to put that phone number up at the end of the program, get a pen handy and a piece of paper, because we have a lot of free Bible study helps that a lot of our viewers have been taking advantage of, and we hope that you would do that if you haven't already. Okay, what is our question this week? Our Bible question centers around marriage. What does the Bible teach about marriage? And sadly, a follow-up to that is, does it speak about divorce? All right, well, we're going to deal with that. And, and some of this stuff is, is, is a subject that is very touchy for a lot of people. I mean, um, the fact that it, it hits home to a lot of folks. But we're just going to see what the Bible has to say and, uh, and go from there. So where would you begin when you talk about marriage? Well, I think you would go to the beginning. Uh, back in Genesis, we find that God created man. Uh, we read about that in Math, or excuse me, Genesis chapter 1 and in verse 26, where he said, let us make man in our image. Well, if we move to the second chapter, which goes a little bit, goes into more detail about that, let's go ahead and notice what it says here, that uh, after he made Adam, and in verse 15, it says, then he, and the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded man, saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you should not eat it, for that the day you eat it, you shall surely die. Now notice what God says in verse 18. He says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird in the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called them, each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names, and but let's move on to verse 21. It says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of uh, his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man. Now, for our subject today, I really want us to pay attention to what is said in verse 24. And we're in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. It says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Now that's interesting that God would decree this, but Adam and Eve didn't have a father or a mother. So we know that this text was put in place for future generations, for even our time period. Now we know that's true because Jesus made reference to that in the New Testament, when somebody or some group of people came to Jesus and they were testing him, they were trying to catch him in something, an inconsistency uh, about the old law. 
And what would Jesus say about marriage and divorce? So for that, we're going to go to Matthew, the 19th chapter. Now, as I said earlier, this is a rather sensitive subject for a lot of people, but the Bible deals with it. And when people ask a Bible question, we'll give them a Bible answer. I'm not here to preach my opinions on this. I might teach, you know, I would not might, I would teach what the Bible says. And somebody might follow up and say, well, Chuck, what do you think about that? Well, it really doesn't matter what my opinion on the matter is. My attitude should always be, if the Lord said it, then that's that ends the matter. And that's what we do here on this program. We consider what the Word of God has to say. So, let's see what happened in Matthew chapter 19 on this subject. We're going to pick it up in verse 3. It says, the Pharisees also came to him, testing him. So it wasn't like they were really wanting to know what the truth is. They were trying to catch him in something. So we know their attitude. But, the, but besides the point, Jesus is going to answer them. So what did they come testing him? He says, well, they came testing him saying, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? So Jesus comes back in verse 4 and says, He answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Here's the Here's the clincher here. I want us to get this. It says, therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. So here's what God's purpose for man and woman when it comes to marriage, that it was going to, it was to be permanent. It was the man and a woman were to be joined together. And it says, what God has joined together, don't let anyone separate. That's what it says. Did people separate? Yes, they did. Do people continue to separate today? Yes, they do. Well, we're not finished because Jesus addresses that matter. So let's see what went on after that. Well, when Jesus said that, remember, they came testing him. And so now what they're going to do is they're going to follow this up with a question in verse 7. It says, well, they said to him, well, why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and put her away. Verse 8. Well, he said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. So we know what God purposed back in the garden. Man shall leave father and mother, and they become one. And what God has joined together, don't let anybody separate that. But we know that man has the choice to do that if they want to, but it would be wrong. But that's not all Jesus said on this. Now notice verse 9. This is a passage that a lot of religious folks don't want to preach. A lot of religious leaders avoid it. They don't want to discuss it because, like I said, it's a very sensitive subject in a lot of circles. But we should never be ashamed of the gospel. We need to preach the word. Second Peter, Paul told Timothy, chapter 4 and verse 2, preach the word, be in season and out of season, which means preach it when it's popular and when it's not. Now, what I'm about to read in verse 9, I don't think we would consider this popular, but it's truth. Now, here's what Jesus said. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife or whoever divorces their husband, it goes either way. But it says, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. Now we can expand on this a little bit because that's not the first time Jesus spoke about this. Over in Matthew chapter 5 during the Sermon on the Mount, Okay, when Jesus started his 
earthly ministry. This was part of his early preaching too. He was very consistent. He said in verse 32 of Matthew chapter 5, I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. Now let's let's go through this and see what, what he's talking about here. It seems rather clear, but we want to make it crystal clear. So what he's saying here is that what God has joined together, no, let no man separate. Now, he goes on to say, you don't divorce your mate for any reason. Remember, he says, whoever divorces his wife. Now, let's take that clause out of there. The clause would be, except for sexual immorality. That's the one exception. If your mate has been unfaithful, Jesus said, you can put that guilty person away. The innocent person can put the guilty person away and the innocent person is allowed to remarry. But to fully understand verse 19, I'm going to skip over that clause so you can follow the thought all the way through. We know what the exception is. The exception is sexual immorality. So let's just take that out of the way and see what he says. I say to you, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. So people cannot divorce in God's eyes. I, I know what people can do today. People, people are doing things against God's ways um, in so many different areas. People lie, cheat, steal, murder. I mean, there's just so many transgressions that are going on because people don't care about what the Bible has to say. And that's certainly true when it comes to the sanctity of marriage and what God intended. What did God intend? Well, he's not saying people have to get married. Let's understand that. The Apostle Paul wasn't married, and he even encouraged people not to get married under that present distress that he was dealing with there. He even came back and said, but if you do marry, then okay, that, that's okay. Um, we're not saying a person has to get married. But what he's talking about here, he says that if a person is married, that's what he said, but if you divorce your mate and you remarry, it's adultery. Well, what happens if you are the put away person? Somebody puts you away. What happens if you get married? Well, that was the Matthew chapter 5, verse 32 text. It said, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife for any reason except, except sexual immorality, immorality causes her to commit adultery. Now, how can you cause, if you put your mate away, how can you cause them to commit adultery if they go and get married? See, the point is, God wants men and women who are married to be committed to one another for life. Now, the Apostle Paul, writing by inspiration, talked more about this subject over in Romans, the seventh chapter. Romans chapter seven. Listen, listen to what Paul talks about here when he says uh, in verse one, do you not know, brethren, and I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over man as long as he lives. He said, for the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So there's another exception. So we've got two so far. A person can remarry if they put their guilty partner away, if they, if they uh, committed adultery. It's lawful to put that person away, and the innocent party can remarry. The only other ex exception as far as being remarried is if your first mate dies or if the second one dies too. But you understand that death uh, severs that. He says in verse 3 of Romans chapter 7, so then if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law so that she is no adulteress, though she's married another man. Now, this passage, again, talks about the concept of being married, right? Um, 
a lot of times you have people today who say that, well, you know, I don't really want to get married. Um, is there anything wrong with just living with somebody? Well, here, here's what Paul deals with in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Again, I told you before when we started this subject, this is a very sensitive issue with a lot of people. But I'm just telling folks exactly what the Bible teaches. You can read this on your own. I'm not adding or taking away from it. So there's something interesting happens in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. The first six chapters, Paul writes to the church and he's dealing with some problems that congregation was having and wanted them to fix it. Well, we also learn from chapter 7 and verse 1 that the church at Corinth obviously had written to Paul asking some questions. How do I know that? Well, look what he says in verse 1. He says, Now, concerning the things of which you wrote me. I wonder what they wrote. Well, I think we get a pretty good idea when we read a little bit here. He says, Now concerning the things which you wrote me, it is not, it, it, he says, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. When did he say that? Well, obviously they wrote him and asked him, is it okay for a man to touch a woman? Well, he says in verse 2, uh, it's good for a man not to, but he says in verse 2, nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, don't want sexual immorality, he says, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. So there's the answer, marriage. And that's what was happening back in the garden. Let um, leave father and mother be joined together, become one flesh, your husband and wife. We read in Romans chapter 7, how long until death do you part? You do that in a ceremony. Um, do you take this man, do you take this woman? And part of that ceremony is till death do you part. So you're not bound to somebody if, they're, if they uh, die, you're free to, to marry somebody else. But what we're noticing in today's study is that God ordained, instituted, established marriage. Okay, he's the one that came up with it. And he put boundaries, right, within the scriptures. And so the Romans chapter 7 is telling us something that I didn't bring up. So I'm going to quickly go back over there and establish this fact. And that is when he says... Um, that so that if while her husband lives, she marries another man. So that's going to do away with a man having two, three, four, five wives at the same time. No, it's against the, the, the scriptures, the New Testament, the gospel that we are under. This is not what God planned. And that's what we read back in Genesis chapter two. Um, man, woman, together for life. Now, what's the exception? We've talked about that. You are going to be bound to your mate as long as they live. But if they commit adultery, if they're unfaithful, you have the biblical authority from the Lord to put them away. Now, a person might say, well, Chuck, if a person did that and that person is sorry, can their mate just say, I forgive you, and can they keep the marriage together? Sure. Sure they could. They could. But we're just, we're just pointing out that if the mate can't cope with that, the Bible clearly tells them that they have authority to put that mate away. Now, what's also interesting within all of this, and we need to keep this in mind too, is that we had the church at Corinth were kind of wondering, you know, should we, if I'm a Christian and my mate's not a Christian, should I, should I put them away? And Paul told them that, no, because you're married. Just because that mate of yours is not a Christian, Paul says, how do you know whether you will be able to teach that person and they will be converted? Um, the husband teaches the wife or the wife teaches the husband. And Paul is saying, no, you, you stay together. See, what we're noticing here is this law of marriage doesn't come upon a person until they become a Christian. No, 
that's upon everybody. Everybody, people that are not Christians. In other words, if you're not a Christian, um, is it wrong to steal something from somebody else only after you become a Christian? No. It's wrong before you become a Christian. Why? Because you're under the law of the Lord. Even though you're not obeying the Lord, that's called sin. This is why Jesus came so that we could have the forgiveness of sin. It's not like you become a sinner after you become a Christian. No, you're a sinner before you become a Christian. Once you become a Christian, you try to sin less. You grow. Not perfect. First John says, if a Christian says they have no sin, they're a liar. It's in First John chapter uh, 1, verses 8 through 10. But Christians will grow and they will sin less and less and get stronger and build up their faith. And so what we're noticing here is that when it comes to uh, the law of a, you know, what God talked about marriage, um, that goes for everybody. Now I'm going to make this quick point because we have a couple of minutes left before we talk about the things that we offer. A person says, well, Chuck, okay, if somebody does divorce their mate and, they, and there was no adultery, well, God says, well, they're still joined together. But what if they marry somebody else? Well, it's called adultery. If you put your mate away for the wrong reason and you marry somebody else, we read where the Lord says that's adultery. The person says, well, Chuck, can they get forgiveness of doing that sin? You can get forgiveness of any sin. But understand what repentance means. Repent means to turn about. And so a person that's in adultery, that married somebody they shouldn't have, and they tell God, I'm sorry for what I've done, it doesn't give them permission to go right back into that marriage. Do you realize there are a lot of religious leaders that say, well, if you tell God you're sorry, it's okay, you can stay in that, that marriage now because it's not adultery anymore. Yeah, it's still adultery. If it's, still, if it's adultery before you repent, then it's adultery after you repent. If you haven't repented and you go right back into it. You say, well, Chuck, I don't understand. Well, it's like this. If I tell God I'm sorry for lying and he forgives me, does that mean I'm allowed to go on and lie now? Well, no. There's no sin that you read about in the scriptures. There's no sin that once you repent of it, it isn't sin anymore. No, it's, st it's still sin. If you, if you murdered and, and you tell God you're sorry, it doesn't give you permission to go murder. So if you're in an adulterous relationship and you tell God you're sorry, there's nothing magical that says, okay, it's not, it's not adultery anymore. It still is. You have to get out of that. Remember what God has joined together. If you separated from your mate without a scriptural reason, you know what? You're still bound to that person. Remember what God has joined together? God joined you to that person. For how long? Till death do you part. And if somebody is committing immorality, God says that's the only exception for separating. And that's what the Bible has to teach, has to say on the matter. And we need to respect the seriousness of marriage. We need to understand the seriousness of any biblical subject. And so maybe this program stirred up a question for you. We would love to hear from you. Now, you see the phone number, and it's going to be up there for the rest of the program, another five minutes. So be sure to write down that number or the website. We'd love to hear from you. Now, the website will be put up in a, in a couple of minutes. But folks, you can call or text us if you would like to learn more of God's Word. We have a six-lesson home Bible study course. This is lesson number one, and there's just six. And it's only two pages stapled together, so it's just like four pages. Um, so you have eight pages in all of questions and things that encourage you to open up your Bibles at home. People want to study the Scriptures, and this is a great tool that encourages you to open up your Bibles at home, and you work at it at your own speed. There's no time limit. But please, go ahead and request this and we put in there a return envelope with a stamp. So when you finish it, just fold it and put it back in the lesson, or in the envelope rather. It will be checked over, and we'll mail it back to you with your next lesson, lesson number two. And we do that all the way through. 
until you finish the six lessons. It's to be a great tool to add to your knowledge, whether you're a novice or somebody who's been studying for quite some time. It's good to review and study God's Word. Now, what we can also do with this, and I encourage you to request that, leave your name and your address. You know what we can put in that lesson are these two pamphlets. Now, a lot of people are requesting these because it has to do with, you know, 30 things that people say are not in the Bible, but they really are. And then you have 40 things that um, are found in the Bible, but people say, um, no, they're, they're not in the Bible. Let's get this. Sometimes I get that confused. But yeah, what, what we have is we have 30 things that people say are not in the Bible, but they really are, and 40 things that people say, that's in the Bible, but it's not. They're not in the Bible. And you can check those out. And so I think it's really important because you're hearing people teaching and preaching things that are not in the Bible. And you're hearing people preach and teach things that they're saying it's not in the Bible. When you can open up your Bible and say, well, there's the verses. That's not true. It is in the Bible. So you can request those pamphlets. And none of the things that we offer, folks, don't ever think that we're looking for a contribution. We don't want any money. We don't want you to send in an offering. None of these things cost anything. Nobody's going to show up at your door. We're just trying to encourage people to do what? What's the name of this program? Study the Word. Study the Word of God. We also can get, put you on the mailing list for the weekly bulletin. If you would like to receive that, short articles, two short articles each week, just to add to your knowledge. And finally... People are taking advantage of the opportunity to have a face-to-face -face Bible study. We can sit around your kitchen table with our Bibles open, and we'll deal with your Bible questions. You say, well, Chuck, I don't have any questions, but do you have some kind of series of studies that we can study? Absolutely. And we'll get together about for 40 minutes each week at a time that fits into your schedule. If you would like a face-to-face -face Bible study, we can meet at the church building, at your home, or coffee shop, wherever you're com uh, comfortable please let us know and we'll fit it into your schedule. And so we just, you know what we're trying to do with this program is help people to learn more about what God has said, such as what we studied today. A lot of people are not aware of the seriousness of marriage and what God has said about marriage and divorce and remarriage. Hope this lesson has been a help to you. Folks, we hope you'll tune in next week as we study the scriptures. And if you have an opportunity the Kirkwood Church of Christ meets every Sunday morning at 9.30 for a Bible study, 10.20 for a worship for about an hour, and then we meet Sunday evenings at 5, from 5 to 6, and we have a midweek Bible study every Wednesday at 7 o'clock from 7 to 8. During Bible classes, we have classes for all age groups, for the children, bring the whole family. We'd love to have you. You'd be our honored guest. We hope, like I said a moment ago, that you'll Tune in next week. Tell your families and friends about this. And don't forget to send in your questions if you have any. Until then, we look forward to studying with you next week. Have yourselves a great day.